Hi, folks. I think we'll get started. Um, welcome, everybody, to I Has Not Seen on Sacred Art. My name is Emily Normand. I am the moderator for this panel of wonderful, wonderful women, and I would like to welcome you all um, to hear them and learn from them and learn with them. Um, I work at the Racklin Murphy Museum of Art on Notre Dame's campus, which is just a short walk that way. So, you know, if you need uh, some quiet time, reflection, um, prayer, just a meditative moment with the museum, that is my shameless plug to visit us. Um, I will now introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Leslie Kurzeder. Leslie is the program director for the Contours of Wonder Initiative at the McGrath Institute for Church Life at the University of Notre Dame. Operating within the Notre Dame Center for Liturgy, this initiative propose, proposes a renewal in children's liturgical formation that both confronts the challenges of the technocratic age and cultivates liturgical imagination. Formerly, Leslie worked as a freelance graphic designer and communications consultant for Catholic organizations locally and abroad. Most recently, she served as the program director for Church Communications Ecology Program at the McGrath Institute. She's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, having earned her BA in history with a concentration in Russian history and MA in theology. So now we will welcome Leslie and I'll introduce our next speakers as they come up to the podium. Everyone give a warm welcome to Leslie Kirsten. Thank you, Emily, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, so I'm going to start with a story that you all know too well by this point. For all the advancements and conveniences that they offer, digital media and technology bring at least as many challenges. From our attention spans to our sense and consciousness of time, space, and self, our understanding of the created world and the material things in it, our capacity to learn, communicate, abide in silence, to loneliness, mental health issues, isolation, manipulation, exploitation, addiction, and our precarious sense of encounter, community, relationship, and authority. The digital age has come to challenge our creaturehood, fundamentally what it means to be human. In addition to the myriad of studies and books that have thankfully been released over the last few years, the church has also had a thing or two to say about digital technology and the delicate ecosystem of an integrated life. Pope Francis, for example, addresses, addresses this at length in Laudato Si. And the latest edition of the Directory for Catechesis warns, the digital, which does not correspond solely to the presence of technological means, in fact, characterizes the contemporary world and its influence has become in a short time ordinary and continuous, so much so as to be perceived as natural. The effect of the exponential digi digitalization of communication in society is leading to a genuine anthropological transformation. So it's imperative, of course, that the church and the academy continue to consider how digital technology is affecting our well-being and our creaturehood. But today I'd like to propose that along with that, we must seriously consider how the habits, sensibilities, and dispositions inculcated in us by digital media and our devices have diminished or replaced altogether those sensibilities essential to us as liturgical creatures. The orientation to and disposition to worship cast by the Son, endowed to us at creation by the Father, and capacitated in us at baptism by the Spirit. The most visible example, of course, is the posture of most 21st century humans, right? Our gaze is constantly locked down <laughs> into our phones instead of up and outward toward God and the cosmos and each other. But there's something even deeper at work here. In his recent apostolic letter on liturgical formation, Pope Francis writes that modern man has become illiterate, no longer able to read symbols, 
It's almost as if their existence is not even suspected. To have lost the capacity to grasp the symbolic value of the body and of every creature renders the symbolic language of the liturgy almost in inaccessible to modern mentality. But in fact, this story isn't new, and neither are Francis' arguments. 100 years ago, Romano Guardini observed, observed the diminishing liturgical sensibilities in the modern industrial person. Long gone, he lamented, was the deep interiority and rich fullness of expression, the thicker understanding of the world and time and space and the ensouled bodiliness but deeply embedded in the medieval consciousness that formed the habits and pace of life of the Middle Ages. So finding themselves needing to counteract what was happening, liturgical reformers at the turn of the century set about fiddling with things like text and music and liturgical forms. But it wasn't the liturgy that had grown incongruent to the faithful. Rather, it was people due to the technologic and technocratic realities of industrial modernity that had grown incongruent with liturgy. So the realities of modern society formed habits and sensibilities that diminished or replaced those natural to us, those that di dispose us to worship. If I'm not mistaken, Gordini offered, the typical 19th century man was not able to perform the liturgical act. Indeed, he was completely unaware of it. He lost his immediate sense of things, his feel for their fullness, and the deep, intensive reality resting within. The faculties by which he was connected to reality shriveled, and all those religious powers that can only live in physical expression had to wither. In Gordini's assessment, we lost our sacramental vision, our liturgical sight. We could no longer see things or materiality or wonder at them and sense the higher tru truths that they contain. Something so fundamental to our creaturehood that it affects our deepest faculties and capacities to worship. In short, Gordini contended, today's problems lie beyond reading and writing but rather in learning how to gaze lively at something. Fast forward to the electric age and we find Marshall McLuhan sensing similar diminishments and replacements. Every new technology, he explains, thus alters the human sensory bias, creating new areas of perception and new areas of blindness. This is as true of clothing as of the alphabet as of radio. McLuhan theorized that the electric-oriented person's visual sense, which had been shaped for centuries by print media, significantly dimmed through the 20th century to the point where, he says, we struggled to relate to the divine on a visual basis. McLuhan illuminated that it's less the content appearing on the technology than the technology itself that affects us by forming our habits, sensibilities, consciousness, and dispositions. So much so that electric environments, he writes, foster the illusion of the world as spiritual substance. So it becomes a reasonable facsimile of the mystical body, a blatant manifestation of the antichrist. The degradation of the eye by the visceral extension electrically of our proprioceptive lives creates the attitudes of involvement and participation in the world of existentiality. Since we're doing these things ourselves, there's no earthly reason for submitting to them unconsciously or irrationally. So in other words, what, um, what would we possibly need for the mystical material reality of the liturgy when we can create that experience ourselves and perpetuate the sensibilities and the habits to sustain them that technology offers us. Gordini, McLuhan, and others observed this trend building for over 100 years. The difference today, however, is the speed at which this trend is building and how it's absorbing us into, into the duality that defines our lives lived out on two planes, 
the real, which has arguably become subservient to the virtual, where discarnate, ethereal, and artificial experiences define our days. So a key contributor to this degradation of our eyes today, of course, is image saturation. No longer limited to physical space, images surround us day and night in almost every place we enter. I read this article yesterday saying that on a daily basis, we see somewhere between four and 10,000 ads online, which was an astonishing number to me. But the ill effects of the digital age on the eyes are not only due to the sheer number of images that we take in, but also the speed at which they strafe us and condition us to respond, and their discarnate, evanescent nature. Rather than building stamina, there's a fatigue that comes from seeing so much all the time. There is, as our dear Joseph Pieper writes, simply too much to see. The discarnate, immaterial nature of digital images, in fact, deadens them. Any hint of power or fullness of meaning the image or symbol once had is flattened by the code that sends it and swiped away by our finger. In his recent book, A Web of Our Own Making, Anton Barbicay explains that immateriality is the condition of the screen's awesome pluripotency the screen can bring you every image precisely because images have no material presence. It's therefore banalizing. Where everything is interchangeable with everything else, images need not be committed to matter. So friends, there's likely a case to be made for the ways that digital media and technology enhance aspects of our sensibilities for worship. But from where I stand, we're under threat of growing increasingly incongruent to liturgy. And the question that now confronts us is immediate and urgent. How might we recover our power of sight? How might we again learn to gaze lively? This question indeed renders the kind of liturgical formation Guardini proposed in 1923 ever more vital 100 years later. As liturgical creatures, he explains, we're ordained with the capacity and mysterious faculties by which the spiritual is translated into the body and by which every form and gesture become one expression of spirit. There he, therefore, he says, it's not a matter of learning something new, but rather recovering long forgotten acts and attitudes. So taking a cue from Guardini, I propose that central to this recovery is intentional, guided re-engagement with materiality and image. Small, frequent practices aimed at counteracting the contra-liturgical effects of the present technological environment. In short, if we want to recover our sight, we have to practice seeing. So what better place to do this than where the image is at its most powerful and worship finds its home? After all, images have always surrounded us in churches. If not before we cross the threshold, then immediately after, we're confronted with artwork of one kind or another. This, it's not surprising, as many of our colleagues at this very conference will attest, visual art stokes the imagination, and its creation can be a deep form of devotion. Thus, the church has always placed a particular importance on sacred art. At its best, art makes the invisible visible, and it helps us move from vision to adoration. Timothy Ferdun argues that sacred art, in fact, helps us learn what to adore. Art in a space of worship can, in wider terms, help us learn, or I'm sorry, help us sustain a particular atmosphere for worship and communion. More narrowly, it invites us to engage with it individually offering to ignite our imaginations and open us to a disposition of wonder. So what's involved then in this pedagogy of counterpractice? Well, the first task I would argue is leveraging the power of image in order to learn to see the familiar anew. Engagement with the content of art, especially in one's own parish church, can prime our eyes to re-see 
what's grown old and invisible until it emerges and blooms before us into something newly unfamiliar and extraordinary. For instance, in my parish church here in South Bend, I go to St. Anthony. The nave is lined with incredible stained glass windows that incidentally has, sa <laughs> has saved it from be becoming um, yet another mid-century architectural nightmare. So there is St. Anthony. Over time, the windows have become overgrown with familiarity in the eyes of many of our parishioners, especially in this age of image fatigue. The glass has lost its luster, its invitation to wonder. Yet if we set about purposefully reseeing the windows, we can take delight in its content, the scenes and the colors, the figures, the stories and the text. We can marvel at postures of praise, prayer, good works, and sacrifice before us, learning anew whom to adore and how. So how might we do this? Well, what if we created a video that we could send around to everybody talking about the windows? Or we can throw some posts on Instagram or Facebook, right? Or maybe even include like a didactic blurb every week in the you know, weekly parish email. And that's kind of the typical MO today, right? Well, um, we're gonna do a little experiment. So I'm gonna have you get your phones out. If they're close by, go ahead and click on this QR code. And you can take a look at our windows. I'm gonna give you 45 seconds, which is the typical amount of time somebody spends on average on a website. So start, I'll keep the time starting now. give you 10 bonus seconds. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, that's time. <laughs> so how many of you think you could tell me with a reasonable amount of confidence what those windows were about? What did they depict? Mm hmm okay, one set depicted the creed. Any other guesses on what the second set might have? Pardon? The Litany of Loretto, very good. Okay, how many of you were tempted to check a notification or answer a text that had just come through? Maybe you did, right? <laughs> okay, how many of you um, actually got caught on one image and zoomed in to investigate a little bit more? Okay. Great. How many tried to flip through, like ran through the museum and flipped through as many as you possibly could? Right. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, you, you all guessed really well here. So um, the windows in the, east, or the eastern wall depict the Apostles' Creed, and the windows to the west depict the Litany of Loretto. They're just, they're absolutely stunning. Um, but my bet is that you approached looking at these windows on your phone the same way that you would have um, checked an Instagram feed or a Facebook feed, right? Or um, a text thread with a, with a bunch of pictures of your sister's kids carving pumpkins. <laughs> so they may bring some delight, but in the end they remain flat, devoid of sanctity, right? Limited by the code that sent them to you. It turns out that the screen, as Barbara, our friend Barbara Kay writes, is an empty vessel less a presence than an absence. It cannot admit of solemnity, of sanctity, because it can't place events, can't set them apart from the rest of our activities. So this brings us to our second task and why these practices need to be in person. Emily, that's your free plug for the museum. <laughs> it's not good enough to send people sacred images on a device. We must engage with artwork on its terms as incarnate material media. 
Art is made of stuff, and it's made by someone. Artwork in a church, for instance, demands that we negotiate ourselves around the place in which it abides. We enter into its space, not the other way around. It embodies texture, captures light and shadow, invites us to move our bodies to engage with it. There's a limited amount to see with no infinite scroll. Nor can we zoom in or swipe it away with a finger. We have to reckon with its substance and conform to its pace, which by its nature bids a slow hermeneutical exchange between ourselves, the art itself, and in a very dense reality of space and time, the artist. Such engagements with materiality are practices in what Gordini calls thingness, a vital sensibility for liturgical, sacramental, proprioception, consciousness, and participation. Because the liturgy, he says, is not a matter of ideas, but of actual things and things as they are now. So every material, every thing from bread and oil and water to the altar and candles to walls and pillars and even space and time is emblazoned with meaning. Engaging with the stained glass at St. Anthony, the thick black letting on fragile panes, how the breeze and clouds and the sunlight outside playfully participate with the scenes within. How you can join in by touching the sun-warmed panes or by walking along, along its panels helps us patiently relearn thingness, how to read symbol. And in doing so, not only the world around us, but the liturgy bursts into life anew. So now that we have a handle on this kind of pedagogy, I'd like to offer an example of such counter practice. So right now I'm working on a guide actually for our parish. The idea is this is a physical book that sits in the back of mass. There's a couple copies. And when people show up, they can grab one and they can sit with it and contemplate. It takes people through the images of the windows in a way that aims to slow down inviting them into contemplation of what they see. And it bids people not only to see the images, but also how the images work in the church, how they play with the elements outside, and how the gazer can enter into the story. For example, with the Apostles' Creed windows that you saw, the guide illuminates how the windows offer a gentle catechesis on the creed and a portal into embodying the creed itself. The guide also encourages communal gazing leveraging the corporate nature of artwork by offering meditations on the art and the creed alongside a seek and find for kiddos that I'm pretty sure adults could delight in too. And the guide en endeavors really to teach people, the people of St. Anthony how to see again. It doesn't give everything away, but rather it invites folks into a way of seeing in order to prompt more seeing. So that brings us to our third task. Any counter practice must be laced with prayer. Images and artwork, as you know, are incredibly powerful. Prayer guards against emotional impact, and it places sensibility above sentimentality, supplies us with the grace to allow the artwork to point us to whom to adore and how. And prayer also lifts these practices from the, from the eyes of the art, I'm sorry, from the eyes of the individual practitioner into the heart of the church. It guards any practice undertaken with art from becoming toil so that it instead it may be transformative. Prayer unites our efforts to liturgical action, invites the Holy Spirit to illuminate our vision with the light of Christ so that we may gaze upon him in the worshiping community, in the things of both the liturgy and the everyday world around us, and then recognize those things as encounter and gift. So it's here, I would argue, that we begin to relearn the acts and long forgotten attitudes essential to us as liturgical creatures. It's here that we're opened to offer what the liturgy demands of us while partaking in, what, in the formation that the liturgy offers us. And it's here that our gaze becomes once again lively and sacred art fulfills its liturgical promise. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Leslie. Now I'd like to welcome Sarah Crow, our second speaker today. Sarah received her BFA in painting and minor in creative writing from the Maryland Institute College of Art in 2013 and her MFA in painting from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2016. She is currently artist in residence at St. Gregory's Hall where she maintains a working studio and teaches workshops on sacred art. She lives and works in Chicago where she is also an adjunct lecturer in the art and design program at St. Xavier University. She has been commissioned to do original sacred art for churches and private clients throughout the United States. Sarah Crow entered the Holy Roman Catholic Church at St. John Cantus Church on the Great Easter Vigil of 2017. She has made private perpetual vows of consecration to the Lord. Please welcome Sarah. Finding me now. Here it is. Okay, thank you very much. So now that we have been reminded how to look, to gaze lively, I want to talk about what we look at in churches. So as a practicing Catholic artist and someone for whom an aesthetic experience has powerful spiritual affect, I have long felt the urgency and the gravity of the question of what kind of art is displayed in Catholic churches. Now, my frequent and heart-wrenching experience is often that the artwork in churches distracts me from prayer rather than assists prayer. Not infrequently, it's blasphemous or indirectly due to its grotesque inappropriateness for the liturgical environment. So in response to these current problems in much so-called Catholic liturgical art, I feel it's necessary to rearticulate a clear criterion for this genre that's both rooted and in, in the inherited corpus of artistic tradition and also open to new inspirations of the Holy Spirit. I will say that as a working artist, I do not hold up my own art as an example of the type of work that I'm calling for, as embodying it and fulfilling it. Instead, I'm going to show with you works of other artists. I have uh, inspirations and convictions in my art which exceed my craft, and I sincerely hope that this is the case for every artist, for there's nothing so opposed to the creative fire than complacency. <clears throat> now. When I say church art, what I am talking about in this paper is Catholic visual art, especially painting, that's suitable or is designed for public display, display in a Catholic church or shrine. What I'm not talking about is all art, all art with religious content, art for private devotional use, religious art of the Protestant or Orthodox churches, or of any other faith. That said, I will make claims about what makes for great church art that transcend that classification, but my focus here is practical to provide criteria for artists and patrons of Catholic liturgical art. Any criteria for something depends on its purpose. In the case of liturgical art, its ultimate purpose is to give glory to God. The primary way that it does this is by assisting our prayer. Doctors of the church teach us that the highest form of prayer is contemplation. Therefore, sacred art should in fact lead us into contemplation. Contemplative prayer in turn brings us into an encounter with God that changes us, that converts and ultimately sanctifies us. This is how God is glorified. Why should we have any lesser goal in mind with religious art than to assist a religious experience. Sacred art um, is not just art that, again, has religious subject matter or decorates the walls of sacred spaces. It must call us to prayer, contemplation, 
encounter, conversion, sanctification. Now, yes, this is all only possible through the grace of God. But the artist must make themselves and their work an apt instrument of God's grace, which does not set up obstacles and distractions um, to the working of his grace through poor craft, arrogance, bad theology, or other issues that I will address. Now, before we cast out into the deep to explore the ways that great works of sacred art positively assist prayer, I want to set forth some criteria that I consider to find the absolute minimal prerequisites for this genre. For that reason, I call them defining criteria. Um, and notwithstanding their simplicity, if followed, these criteria alone would in fact provide a major reform in liturgical art today. The first category I have is theological orthodoxy. It should not represent things contrary to our faith, whether again explicitly blasphemous or simply bad theology. Um, so guard yourselves, I'm going to show some examples throughout these categories, negative and positive, with my childlike check or X's below them. <laughs> I will not call out the artists of the work that I have put little red X's under. <clears throat> so category one, theologically orthodox. Two, representational, why? Because of the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. Since God revealed his face in Jesus, we must depict his human face while suggesting its divinity. So it's not just abstract versus representational, I see what this is, it's a human or part of creation. With representation comes the need for a means to depict Christ and the saints in glory that does not reduce them to superficial tropes. Whether portraiture that is naturalistic and lacking any sign of transcendence, photorealism, <clears throat> inappropriately secular or objective types of beauty, like airbrushed magazine models or muscle men, or merely pretty and sentimental illustrations. These are all poor substitutions for glorified humanity. We must look to sacred art history for better means and methods. Intelligibility. Sacred art should be able to be understood by the faithful, not incoherent or occult. It doesn't mean that it can have complexity or layers of subtlety but it should not be completely impenetrable. These are all, by the way, depictions of the Holy Trinity. Mastery of craft, oops, there we go. <clears throat> so let the art not distract and disturb us simply because it is badly or amateurly produced. This is a particular cross for artists looking at art. All of this, these my defining criteria, taken for granted, let us cast out into the deep. Living tradition, this is the title of my talk. Like the church's sacred tradition, capital T, the art that has grown in her womb is a continuous living stream with its headwaters being Christ himself. Its continuity is revealed through its drawing upon those myriad visual forms that are represented in the inherited corpus of art designed not only to adorn, but to assist the heavenly liturgy. It is also living, which necessarily means changing. Sacred art not only can, but must, be grounded in the timeless doctrinal truths of our Catholic faith and informed by the history of Catholic art so as not to be ashamed and embarrassed in the company of the old masters, while simultaneously responding to its contemporary needs and reflecting the spiritual insights of the contemporary maker and his society. This is just like today's saint is holy. Like all the saints before them, that is like Christ, today's saint is also necessarily sanctified within the particular temporal contemporary circumstances of his or her lifetime. Great liturgical art in the West, in particular, embodies in a profound and direct way the mystery of the incarnation of God. The artist's own humanity, their talents and temperaments, and finite circumstances, place and period, are not obfuscated and negated. Rather, they're placed in service to a divine end, the very worship and representation of God. 
In this way, the particular genius of the individual artist is inextricably caught up in the communication of the transcendent, reflecting Christ's own dual humanity and divinity. This lively dynamic opposes two ubiquitous errors in contemporary liturgical art. On the one hand, a dead end and ahistorical nostalgia, and on the other hand, an infatuation with novelty, which sees history as limiting and or obsolete. Against these disturbing trends, I posit two additional criteria for liturgical art. The first, specific to its contemporary context, so it should not arbitrarily reproduce a preferred historical style with no regard to the historical circumstances that inform that style or whether or not it's appropriate to that artwork's context. Um, when we reproduce only what we're familiar with, um, as we saw with the kind of abundance of images that we take for granted, our very familiarity can numb us to art's genuine power. Um, if we think of the artists that we just accept as great, you know, be it the audacity of Caravaggio, the singularity of El Greco, the scandalous humanism of Michelangelo, or the concrete mysticism of Grunewald. These works were new and strange and controversial when they were made. The second one is inspired by our history. So art which is merely of the moment, but has no foundation in church or art history is not appropriate for a liturgical context. Seeking after novelty for its own sake is antith antithetical to Christianity and Christian art. Matthias Grunewald's masterpiece, the Isenheim altarpiece, will be our historical reference for how this dynamic of tradition and innovation can be symbiotic, um, while from its other exemplary qualities we will draw out our additional criteria for what makes for great church art in all times. So commissioned between 1508 and 1516 by the Antonite Monastery of St. Anthony in Isenheim, the altarpiece originally stood on the main altar of the monastery church. The German artist, Grunewald, chose not to integrate the recent pictorial and philosophical developments of the High Renaissance in his 16th century altarpiece. He instead found resonance for his artistic program with late Gothic and um, early Northern Renaissance panel painting. He nonetheless employed those historical forms and iconography in completely unique ways that were both highly specific to his contemporary client and visionary in reimagining his representation of sacred subjects. Structurally, the Isenheim altarpiece um, is a polyptic, multi-paneled in three layers. So it's composed of multiple panels that can be opened to reveal three layers of images to be displayed according to the feast or fast days of the liturgical year. The altarpiece's structure, its liturgical variability, its materials, techniques, and dense layering of religious imagery and symbolism are all typical of early Netherlandish art. But we see a startling local and contemporary specificity in the altar's design and imagery in the myriad ways it served the clients of the monastery's hospice. Victims of the mortal disease called St. Anthony's Fire which caused um, madness, hallucinations, and gangrene of the hands and feet, um, as well as other patients with skin diseases who the Antonite monks ministered to. First, there was the actual physical relationship of the viewers to the altarpiece. The holy sacrifice of the mass was celebrated at the altar, whose size and location were designed to accommodate the participants. Additionally, the infirm were brought bodily in front of the altar to pray with the larger-than-life suffering Christ and saints, including the patron saint of the victim, St. Anthony. They were reported to have also received, praying in front of this altar, a drink of fortified wine in which the relics of St. Anthony were actually soaked. Therefore, they were physically and mystically, through the relics as well as through the Holy Eucharist, united with the figures represented in the painting while gazing upon them. Surely this is the most direct relationship possible. Second, the narrative and symbolic dimension of the painting is specifically designed to resonate with the victims on multiple levels. Grunewald's depiction of Christ crucified is appallingly gruesome. He is shown suffering on the cross with the same disease in his extremities as the hospice patients. This artistic portrayal 
would have allowed the patients to see the reality of Christ's suffering with and for them in a very personal, new, and concrete way. Similarly, um, as the patients sought the intercession of St. Anthony, who in the third state of the altar, shown here, um, is depicted in his temptation, being tormented by nightmarish demons. They would have empathized with his temptations either as symbolizing the torments they themselves were undergoing, or perhaps as literal depictions of their own terrifying hallucinations. Third, the whole pictorial program, that is the representational style, suited the viewers. The expressivity, expressivity pardon, of the figures and the supernatural and otherworldly atmosphere, especially the risen and glorified Lord, who looks not like some idealized man, but more like a human veil over the sun, almost too bright to look at. These all help to communicate the spiritual meaning of suffering and hope in eternal life. We see that the diverse elements in Grunewald's masterpiece, physical structure, narrative, symbology, and style, were in no way arbitrary, but in perfect harmony with the religious aims and functions of the artwork. To attain those aims, the artist necessarily employed traditional and historical forms while adapting them to his unique vision and local concerns. This is the synthesis and integrity that great art demonstrates. What we ask of liturgical art is that it assists prayer. This is my final criteria. This is an affective dynamic, not reducible to the representation of religious subject matter. How is this achieved? We see from um, Grunewald's altarpiece, um, that this artwork has done this in diverse ways. First, in relationship to the positioning of the viewer, the actual physical object. The viewer is called to interact, pay attention, or empathize with the work, or what it portrays in such a way that their perspective is altered. Then, revelatory, poetic, or prophetic visual presentation of a mystery or dynamic of the faith, also, symbols or layers of meaning embedded in the work so that it reveals more as more time is spent with it, barely touched on the symbolism in this particular altarpiece. And then finally, the cumulative impact of the whole work of art and its marriage of form and content so that they cannot be meaningfully separated and say um, that this is what they are while making sense. They inform each other. Um, so the cumulative impact of the whole such that the viewer experiences awe or pain or joy and is led to contemplation. This is what I call beauty. Now, I've purposely waited until now to invoke the name of beauty. <laughs> I will return to her spiritually on my knees momentarily. What I want to impress first is that what is at stake in the so-called religious intention, the way that an artwork assists prayer, is that the viewer is affected in such a way that he has a religious experience through the work of art. This is the ultimate goal of church art and what alone makes it great. Beauty. The reason I did not simply say church art must be beautiful and thus begin and conclude my talk is for two reasons. One is because the term beauty is grossly overused. Um, many of my fellow Catholics love to discuss the theology of beauty but it appears that they are often less able to discern its presence or lack in art. This is a problem of our formation. The term is often used to describe what people like or are comfortable with. Beauty is not comfortable. <laughs> An encounter with beauty, like saintly goodness, convicts us of our own sins and calls us to be more. Just to look at something beautiful, we often feel that our souls must dilate in order to receive it. Its apparent perfection reveals to us our imperfections and arouses our desire to be better. At the same time, beauty is mercy made tangible. In spite of our wounded and weak nature, especially as artists, God's beauty can be communicated through the work of our hands. So I argue that we must reject good enough and comfortable art. It is not honest and ask for something more. I'll say the second reason I did not lead with beauty 
is that I'm not wise enough to call from philosophy and theology a practical definition for artists and patrons that effectively covers the whole spectrum of works of art that produce that inner tremor that signifies its presence. Before the mystery of beauty, as before the face of God, let us kneel and offer thanksgiving and the sacrifice of our desire. Now, I want to show that great church art can be made in modern and contemporary times. I will briefly introduce some modern and contemporary examples of sacred art. Not all of these um, were designed for liturgical settings, but all of them I deem suitable to ornament churches. The first modern artist I want to highlight um, is late 19th and early 20th century French artist Maurice Demy. Originally a founding member of the novice group of artists who rejected contemporary naturalism in favor of a more expressive style, um, Denis later founded an atelier dedicated to the training of young artists in religious decoration. His religious work integrates the formal innovation of his contemporaries with a profound devotional sensibility, reimagining the Annunciation in particular in a contemporary domestic setting as artists have done for centuries, but with light, color, composition, and texture, all combining to communicate the simultaneously supernatural, yet joyfully intimate nature of the event. <clears throat> in chronological order, the next artist that I will show an example of is uh, Winifred Knights. She's a 20th century British painter. Um, Knights only made one work in her short career that meets the criteria I have presented for liturgical art. This work was in fact commissioned for a church, Canterbury Cathedral, and portrays scenes from the life of St. Martin of Tours. It was commissioned for St. Mary's Martin's Chapel in Canterbury Cathedral, but was not lauded or even displayed in its intended setting when it was finally completed. Nonetheless, it is a consummate masterpiece, influenced by the Italian Quattrocento, yet also surrealistic. Her figures emanate light and she juxtaposes their statue-like gravity with a highly active split composition. <clears throat> the final artist I will show, visionary artist Ernst Fuchs, was a Jewish convert to Catholicism. Now I submit he has work, very little work that is liturgically suitable. Um, he's an incredible artist and the work I've chosen to share his three mysteries of the sacred rosary paintings are displayed in a church sanctuary in Vienna. Like Knight's work, his was not well received and there was significant controversy surrounding it. In 1979, all three paintings were badly damaged by an iconoclast. They're now um, restored and in situ in the Church of the Holy Rosary. The three paintings represent the joyful, sorrowful and glorious mysteries the joyful, the glorious, and the sorrowful. They invoke medieval illumination, an association confirmed by the stretched par their stretched parchment-like display, um, their saturated hues, stylized figures, and iconographic density. Yet they are also startlingly new, unprecedented, and authentic to Fuchsia's personal, religious, and artistic journey. My final words will be to reiterate the importance of the question of what kind of art we display in our churches and what it does. I have wrestled with this question and have prayed and have wept about it. It is my sincere hope that the criteria I've set forth will be a practical use to artists and patrons alike. If nothing else, I hope that my presentation helps to cultivate respect for the sacred work that art can and must do. We are physical creatures and art which communicates to our senses, senses is necessary to help form us. No one can contest that we are bombarded with imagery, much of which, which impoverishes our imaginations and appetites. How is the art in our churches forming us? Does it lead us to God? Let us not settle for anything less. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.
will now introduce our final speaker for this session, Anastasia Tess Cassidy. Um, Tess Cassidy studied art and art history at the University of Michigan and Indiana University. She has spent the last 10 years teaching high school advanced art and art history at Trinity School at Green Lawn. She is a professional freelance artist and specializes in sacred art. Some of her commissions include church murals, altarpiece paintings, paschal candles, Byzantine icons, gilding sacred architecture such as baldacchinos, illustrating books and book covers in private oil paintings. Please welcome me in joining Tess Cassidy. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna sit down if that's okay. The first part of my presentation is just going to be a spoken lecture and then because I'm an artist and I'm a visual learner, you will have the second half of all visuals. Um, and also, I just have to say before you make fun of me, I ran out of normal paper. So I, that's one reason. I don't want to like sit there like scrolling through everything. Um, sorry, I'm like so distracted by these two presentations that I'm like, I kind of want to change everything that I wrote to like bounce off of that. So I might skip through things because I really want to you kind of called the issue of a problem that we need to fix. You had like a call to action for artists. So I'm gonna focus on like the patron um, call of action, like what all of us can do. So I might be like in the middle of a sentence and then just like, wait, I'm gonna go to the next thing. Um, so I'm gonna begin by stating that I'm an artist, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a philosopher, and I'm not a public speaker. So I'd rather be alone in a studio right now, and I think Sarah would as well. So us being here, we, we love you all a lot to do this. Um, I have strong ideas concerning art and stronger ideas concerning sacred art, and I was asked to speak primarily about Byzantine iconography, which is the whole second half, but I really want to touch base on some of the things that Sarah said. Um, I want to put a plug out there for sacred artists out there, um, and my two main points then would be, I'll try to keep them organized with a crazy artist brain and kind of on the fly changing my speech, but the importance of fostering sacred art and the importance of an original Byzantine icon. And they're kind of very different points, but I think we can kind of tie them together. But one thing I hear way too often is something along the lines of no good sacred art has been produced since the Baroque period or the Renaissance, um, et cetera, et cetera. And Sarah really showed us that that's not the case, which is great. Um, and it doesn't need to be purely subjective. There's an argument to be had there. But instead of continually arguing this point, let's do something about it, and you like set me up perfectly for this. But I wanna talk about what's changed since then a lot um, from the, the time of Caravaggio, Michelangelo, Raphael. In fact, so much innovation within the field of painting has changed. We have aluminum tubes to keep paint fresh, and we're able to travel with them and paint in plein air instead of using like pig's intestines to do so or nothing at all and just painting in the studio from your mind. Um, and let's say like the instability of organic pigment, we can stabilize things now and we can imitate pigment so that we don't have things like oxidizing colors where Mary's robes turn from like heavenly blue to like earthly green, like that's a massive problem. So we have all these great innovations, pre-stretched canvases, pre-made solvents, varnishes, um, literally the definition of perfect convenience, um, the ability for artists to create on impulse, um, dedicating more time creating the art itself than creating the substrate and the paint. But even with these innovations, sacred art did not continue in the explosive trajectory that we've seen um, in, in past centuries. So I would argue the biggest variable change, the biggest detriment was the patron artist relationship. Um, so the artists we talked about before, Michelangelo, Rafael Caravaggio, they all were employed and possessed consistent patronages, either through the church itself or through wealthy families. They were able to focus and immerse themselves completely and entirely in art. Nowadays, that's not really the case. Artists are artists on the side or as a second job. Only after many years of me producing art am I able to primarily focus on art as my primary career choice. And so I guess we could talk about how to fix this. Um, and one thing, one thing we can do is we can separate ourselves from the secular world. We've never really had problems with that in the church before. So um, this should, should be easy. But um, 
like for instance, I can't tell you the amount of times, and I'm sure Sarah has gone through this or any artist that when people asked me in college what I'm studying, and I'd say art, and then they'd have the like funny joke about, oh, you're majoring in uh, like homelessness and unemployment, way to go. And like the amount of like jokes, but it's not really a joke. They're actually pretty serious about this. And then in my art classes, if I had anything remotely sacred, I was like a laughing stock. So I'm like put down by society and then I'm like put down by my fellow artists and then where do I go from here? Like that's not gonna foster an environment for young people to continue to, to create sacred art. Um, so within sacred art, so again, I like how you put like, I'm not talking about anything but church art. So I'm gonna talk about sacred art and in particular, we'll, we'll stick with painting since that's kind of the, the, the way we're going. So the first thing is, as a lady, um, as a church, we need to respect and uplift the position and the career and the importance of an artist. Whether they're eight years old and they wanna, they wanna be an artist, we have to foster that. Um, and there, let's go into like the two major types of um, patronages today. So you have, on one hand, you have the church, major institutions, universities, where there's lots of money um, and bigger commissions, almost like a, more of like a, salary type position, position as a painting painter. And then you have um, personal commissions, so people of the church commissioning one thing, like a one-off commission. So the, I would argue that the former patronage would be the one that needs to change most. Um, most churches today that are being rebuilt or renovated seem to follow the pattern of hiring out from two major firms. And I might, I might uh, make some people angry. I hope Sarah's, I won't use names, but Sarah will know what I'm talking about. So, there are like two major firms that a church has money to rebuild or um, redo paintings of the church and they will go to these firms and these firms are producing artwork that is, uh, there's really no other like word other than like meh. Like I wouldn't even give it a good adjective of like they're a dearth of, like it's just meh. It's lacking in any kind of light line composition style. Like they're not tapping into like the real deep part of art and beauty. Um, and not use beauty lightly. So it's a safety, it's a safe kind of thing and it's comfortable. I love the word that you use, that it's very comfortable, but in fact, it, it doesn't do any, it's, it's forgettable and it's not what we need to do. So it's space filler even. And I, I could go on and on and I'm sure Sarah could too, but I'm gonna focus back on what you could do as a lady because I think that would be the most important part to do. Um, so how can you help this movement in the church to promote and create new sacred art? Honestly, commissioning work from the artists themselves, finding an art student in university, even an exceptionally talented high schooler from your parish. Believe me, their art will be, bring more spiritual fulfillment than a mere print that is probably illegally produced anyway and really bad like color quality. And again, even, even a print of Caravaggio is not what you need. You can have it, it's not gonna be bad, but um, fostering the vocation and career path of budding artists. Show them there is a want, a need for their talents. Find an artist selling prints with their originals online um, or reproductions of their originals so that it can sustain them to produce more originals that can be in the house. But this is where I'll tie in Byzantine iconography because that's what I promised I would talk about. Um, and this is where I become full-blown like opinionated Eastern European, um, and I'm sorry. But a reproduced print of Western art, Western sacred art, is not the same as a reproduced print of a Byzantine icon. I said it, and I'm sorry if, like, I'm, I'm really happy that the, well, let me just read, I'm gonna get on a tangent, so I'll just keep reading. The role of the artist in Byzantine iconography reaches beyond the artistic realm. It crosses over into the spiritual. As an example, Caravaggio created incredible works of art, but approached them as art, a job, and was probably honestly still drunk from the bars the night before um, and beat people up, he killed people, and he still produced what we call the most beautiful sacred art. Um, that is not, and I don't even know where I am because I'm, I'm getting on a tangent. Um, an iconographer approaches the icon process itself as a prayer. Some fast, and I'm gonna be, when I'm talking about Byzantine iconography, I'm trained in the, the Russian Orthodox way, the Eastern, which started in Ukraine, so that's my plug for Ukraine. Um, there's, a, there's another kind of school of thought of uh, Greek iconography, which is similar, but it's very different in the approach, um, the spiritual approach in the beginning. Um, 
So the difference on some, some of these, uh, these Russian priests, they fast and they're perpetual vegans for the fast of creating their icon. Um, the differences between original icons, so like the actual panel itself and the print are different in so many ways. And artistically, you can imagine the real gold versus scanned and printed gold. So we don't need to, to get into that. I wanna talk about the spirituality. Um, the icon is written for the patron. The intentions of the patron are continually prayed for while creating the work. The finished pieces are what some call windows into heaven, but the prayer begins far, far before the patron ever receives the icon. I'm Ukrainian and I grew up with icons everywhere. But with the advent of the Western church becoming fascinated in the art form and creating and mass producing 2D prints everywhere, there's a bit lacking when it comes to the knowledge and importance of the process and the creation of the original piece. Western theologians have excitedly celebrated the beauty of the theology of the painting slash writing um, side of it. Painting from dark to light, going from darkness and chaos with God breathing life into the icon and so on and so forth. And it's really great that I don't need to sit there and tell you this. I, I think a lot of you know that process or can find great videos of theologians that are trained other than me telling you about this process. Um, but then what's crazy is with modern innov innovations in art, it's incredibly convenient to just create at our fingertips. But with Byzantine iconography, nothing's changed. Sure, some people could create in like um, acrylic or, or panels, but like the real tradition of Byzantine iconography has not changed. It's literally ever ancient, ever new. The techniques, the processes, they've been passed down from iconographer to iconographer to iconographer. And as the tradition goes from the very first icon of St. Luke, so there's that beautiful, beautiful kind of process that we're using the elements that they would have used. We're making our paint, the recipes have been handed down. Um, and they'll have these like little changes, whether you use honey or linseed oil based on geographic like, location. Um, but when you commission an icon, you're receiving way more than just a pretty gilded painting of a holy individual. You're receiving hours and hours of prayer and intentionality. Now get this, so I'm primarily a trained oil painter, and I, both, I paint both secular and sacred art. And within, within that non-Byzantine um, realm, um, I like, will cre create work in many different mediums. And from what I've told you about the ease of modern innovation within the art world, one might think that my most common commission or the chunk of my commissions is going to be from modern art. What's easier to make? What's quicker? What's cheaper? What's easily reproduced as a print to look exactly like the original? And that's completely wrong. I have way more commissions for Byzantine iconography. Um, and there's beginning to be a desire of something more. So talking about the bombardment of just digital imagery or just prayer cards, prints everywhere, it's not a bad thing, but there is a desire for something that is more than just an image. Um, and so with this process that's and this method that's so interwoven in our Christian tradition, um, people are beginning to see that. So. That being said, um, hopefully you have the desire to support sacred art and the movement of sacred art so that maybe the next generation there is a career path that is viable. Like I wanna be a sacred artist. I wanna work um, as under a, like a patron. Um, dioceses could start to have like an artist in residence, like the beauty that could, could be. Um, but it really kind of starts with us and the laity um, to, to really like practice what we preach because it's easy to say like, yeah, the Vatican needs to, produce more art or so on and so forth. And I could get into the latest art um, competition that they, they did, but if you actually break it down, it's total slave labor. The, the amount, the lack of money and what they expect in the time period, it's total slave labor. So even like when people are like, wow, $40,000 or whatever it was, like for 14 five foot by five foot oil paintings that you have to pay, like you're, you're probably gonna lose money to be honest. So even our like the highest part of our church institution like we need to we need to make a change but i think i think we could we could do it ourselves and, and demand more um, okay so back to byzantine iconography how am i doing on time uh, danny <laughs> okay so i will i will 
show you the video of Byzantine iconography. It's very light on the actual painting of, and like, again, I could get into the painting writing aspect. It's a really kind of a translation issue. So if you feel like you, you hear someone that they say writing icons or painting icons instead of writing, don't be the snob that says, actually, you write icons. It's a matter of translation. You, you paint a fence, but you are the author of something big. So again, I always try to tell people, like I'd rather build people up um, in their excitement. But I'm gonna show you a video, and it's gonna be um, just the process, and it's a laborious process. And I try to caption it a little bit um, for you. And just knowing I cut out probably 40 hours of gesso work. So like that's boring to watch 20 layers of gesso being applied and sanded down. So that mortification, that penance that's involved. Um, so let's just let's just go ahead and play it. I'll cut the rest of the, the stuff. But support the local artists and the young artists. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna narrate. That's just gonna be cheesy and awkward. So I'll let you just kind of um, get enmeshed. It's following like three main like main um, icons that were written. So, hopefully. <laughs> Sorry, the videos were taken by like an eight-year-old while I did, so um, excuse the shaky iPhone. <laughs> It's supposed to say vinegar or white wine.
sorry, that's supposed to say gold leaf. Um, and the static is used to remove it from the booklet where it needs to be. This is the part of the process that uh, iconographer told me that you find out if your prayers were strong enough. Um, so this next part, you'll see why. You won't know if it pulls everything off until it's too late. So seeing the ugly phases, which has a theology of its own, of underneath we are all sin, and God breathes more and more um, into us. So that's just to show you, like, if you were bored sitting there watching 10 minutes, um, the importance of the actual icon. Um, and I know sometimes they can be expensive, but um, really saving up and having one um, in your house, there are many iconographers out there. So again, the, the prayer, the role of the artist, it's more than just an art form. It's my spirituality as well. So I won't go over, Danny's looking at me. I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we're, we're 
Over time, but we can take, well, if you, if you don't mind sitting tight for a minute or two, um, we'll do a, a brief abridged Q&A um, if you have any questions for any of our speakers. Now is your time to ask. This question is for Sarah, but if you want to add to it, you mentioned that one of the criteria is that art needs to reveal our mm -hmm. Lord's face, uh, but also show his divinity. Uh, and that struck me because I think in the incarnation, like he hid his divinity, and even like I'm thinking of the King of Philippians. So I, 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 I have an intuition that you're right, but I don't know if you could. But, talk about like, the human and the divine in the work of art, and maybe you can do it. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, I will actually go ahead and um, draw on how I have seen iconography do this in fact, because I think it, it really highlights this mystery. So specifically not imitating nature. And the more than or other than nature that it is revealing through its stylized forms, right? It's, 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 it's not just, okay, here's my friend, and then there's the virgin, you know? Um, and they're, not, they're, not, they're, they're on the same level. It's showing you that even what the art is communicating to your senses is there's more beyond it, that there's heaven beyond it, that these are glorified or, you know, or our actual Lord and Savior. And so, uh, although... You know, Christ, yes, veiled his humanity in, in uh, or veiled his divinity in his, his humanity, his flesh. Um, works that represent God and the saints, um, they're already veiled. I mean, it's just, what is it? It's dust and oil or egg. It's already veiled by the very fact, right, that we're attempting to give a, you know, a, a um, representation through a work of art, through finite means. Um, it's another, all art is another veiling, right, of the mysteries, these invisible realities that this visible thing is communicating. Um, but what happens when you see all of these pictures of Jesus and the saints that are just like your buddy and your friends next door is that it trivializes the mystery. In fact, it just strips the representation of mystery. Um, and we need that mystery in order to come into that relationship. Any other questions? I guess I have one for Leslie. Oh, sure. Um, I love your booklet that you did for the parish. How do we get more parishes into this? Because we have, I mean, do, <laughs> right. given the artwork that's in the parishes currently, do we, can we rescue that? With, some type of catechesis in the booklet and contemplation. Where do we start with that? Where do we, you know, with what, or even a parish that does have good art. Like right. How do we sort of guide them into doing this? Yeah, I know. I think that's a really great question. And, um, you know, I do think that this is something that can easily be incorporated, especially if your parish has a school. Um, it can be easily incorporated into a curriculum. Um, if if teachers are willing to take the time to really investigate, either with the pastor or with um, somebody in the parish who has uh, is bent toward catechesis and maybe is interested in the arts. But I really think it's something that we can take up um, on our own. I don't think you necessarily need an art degree to engage with, with art in your church. Sometimes it's just an invitation, really, or somebody that's willing to say, hey, you know, let's spend a half an hour after mass um, taking a look at this piece that's been in our church that nobody notices anymore um, and talk about what we see. It can be as simple as that. So there's definitely, you know, the higher level <laughs> of this that can happen um, depending on the parish that you're at, but certainly something very simple can start at least a, re a re engagement, an invitation into engaging with um, pieces within your own church. Is that helpful? Okay, well, um, please give another thank you to all of our speakers.